I'll be reading The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a uh, story written in verse. Part one, in the beginning was the word. Friday, August 24th, stoop sitting. The summer is made for stoop sitting. And since it's the last week before school starts, Harlem is opening its eyes to September. I scope out this block I've always called home. Watch the old church ladies, chancletas flapping against the pavement, their mouths letting loose a train of island Spanish as they spread he said, she said. Peep papote from down the block as he opens the fire hydrant so the little kids have a sprinkler to run through. Listen to honking cabs with bachata blaring from their open windows, compete with basketballs echoing from the little park. Laugh at the viejos, my father not included, finishing their dominoes tournament with hard slaps and yells of capicu. Shake my head as even the drug dealers posted up near the building smile more in the summer, their hard scowls softening into glue-eyed stares in the direction of the girls in summer dresses and short shorts. Eo, Ziomara, you need to start wearing dresses like that. Shit, you'd be wifed up before going back to school, especially knowing you church girls are all freaks. But I ignore their taunts, enjoy this last bit of freedom, and wait for the long shadows to tell me when mommy is almost home from work, when it's time to sneak upstairs. Unhideable. I am unhideable. Taller than even my father, with what mommy has always said, was a little too much body for such a young girl. I am the baby fat that settled into D cups and swinging hips so that the boys who called me a whale in middle school now ask me to send them pictures of myself in a thong. The other girls call me conceited, ho, thought, fast. When your body takes up more room than your voice, you are always the target of well-aimed rumors, which is why I let my knuckles talk for me which is why I learned to shrug when my name was replaced by insults. I forced my skin just as thick as I am. Mira muchacha is mommy's favorite way to start a sentence. And I know I've always already done something wrong when she hits me with look girl. This time it's Mira muchacha. Marina from across the street told me you were on the stoop again, talking to los vendero vendedores. Like usual, I bite my tongue and don't correct her because I hadn't been talking to the drug dealers. They'd been talking to me. But she says she doesn't want any conversation between me and those boys or any boys at all. And she better not hear about me hanging out like a wet shirt on a clothesline just waiting to be worn or she would go ahead and be the one to wring my neck. Oiste, she asks, but walks away before I can answer. Sometimes I want to tell her the only person in this house who isn't heard is me. Names. I'm the only one in the family without a biblical name. Shit, Xiomara isn't even Dominican. I know because I googled it. It means one who is ready for war. And truth be told, that description is about right because I even tried to come into the world in a fighting stance, feet first had to be cut out of mommy after she'd given birth to my twin brother Xavier just fine. And my name labors out of people's, some people's mouths in the same awkward and painful way until I have to say it slowly. See Omara. I've learned not to flinch the first day of school as teachers get stuck, stupid, trying to figure it out. Mommy says she thought it was a saint's name, gave me this gift of battle and now curses how well I live up to it. My parents probably wanted a girl who would sit in the pews wearing pretty florals and a soft smile. They got combat boots and a mouth silent until it's sharp as an island machete. The first words. Pero tu no eres fácil is a phrase I've heard my whole life. When I come home with my knuckles scraped up, pero tu no eres fácil when I don't wash the dishes quickly enough, or when I forget to, forget to scrub the tub, pero tu no eres fácil. Sometimes it's a good thing. When I do well on an exam, 
or the rare time I get an award. Pero tu no eres fácil, when my mother's pregnancy was difficult, and it was all because of me, because I was turned around, and they thought that I would die, or worse, that I would kill her. So they held a prayer circle at church, and even Father Sean showed up at the emergency room. Father Sean, who held my mother's hand as she labored me into the world, and Poppy paced behind the doctor, who said that this was the most difficult birth she'd been a part of. But instead of dying, I came out wailing, waving my tiny fists. And the first thing Poppy said, the first words I ever heard, pero tu no eres fácil, you sure ain't an easy one. Mommy works cleaning an office building in Queens, rides two trains in the morning, early morning, so she can arrive at the office by eight. She works at sweeping and mopping, emptying trash bins, and being invisible. Her hands never stop moving, she says, her fingers rubbing the material of plastic gloves like the pages of her well-worn Bible. Mommy rides the train in the afternoon, another hour and some change to get to Harlem. She says she spends her time reading verses, getting ready for the evening mass, and I know she ain't lying. But if it were me, I'd prop my head against the metal train wall, hold my purse tight in my lap, close my eyes against the rocking, and try my best to dream. Thursday, August 28th, Confirmation Class. Mommy has wanted me to take the Sacrament of Confirmation for three years now. The first year, in eighth grade, the class got full before we could sign up, and even with all her heavenly pull, Mommy couldn't get a spot for Twin and me. Father Sean told her it'd be fine if we waited. Last year, Caridad, my best friend, extended her trip in DR right when we were supposed to begin the classes, so I asked if I could wait another year. Mommy didn't like it, but since she's friends with Caridad's mother, Twin went ahead and did the class without me. This year, Mommy has filled out the forms, signed me up, and marched me to church before I can tell her that Jesus feels like a friend I've had my whole childhood who has suddenly become brand new, who invites himself over too often, who texts me too much. A friend I just don't think I need anymore. I know, I know, even writing that is blasphemous. But I don't know how to tell mommy that this year. It's not about feeling unready. It's about knowing that this doubt has already been confirmed. God. It's not any one thing that makes me wonder about the capital G-O-D, about a holy trinity that don't include the mother, It's all the things. Just seems as I got older, I began to really see the way that church treats a girl like me differently. Sometimes it feels all I'm worth is under my shirt and not between my ears. Sometimes I feel that turning the other cheek could get someone like my brother killed. Sometimes I feel my life would be easier if I didn't feel like such a debt to a God that don't really seem to be out here checking for me. Mommy, I say to her on the walk home. The words sit in my belly and I use my nerves like a pulley to lift them out of my mouth. Mommy, what if I don't do confirmation? What if I waited a bit for, but she cuts me off, her index finger, a hard exclamation point in front of my face. Mira muchacha, she starts, I will feed and clothe no heathens. She tells me I owe it to God and myself to devote. She tells me this country is so soft and gives kids too many choices. She tells me if I don't confirm here, she will send me to DR, where the priests and nuns know how to elicit true piety. I look at her scarred knuckles. I know exactly how she was taught faith. When you're born to old parents, who'd given up hope for children and then are suddenly gifted with twins, You will be hailed a miracle, an answered prayer, a symbol of God's love. The neighbors will make the sign of the cross when they see you, thankful you are not a tumor in your mother's belly, like the whole barrio feared. When you're born to old parents, continued. Your father will never touch rum again. He will stop hanging out at the bodega, where the old men go to flirt. He will no longer play music that inspires swishing or thrusting. You will not grow up listening to the slow pull of an accordion or the rake of the guira. Your father 
will become an un hombre serio. Merengue might be your people's music, but Poppy will reject anything that might sing him toward temptation. When you're bor born to old parents continued again, your mother will engrave your name on a bracelet. The word mi hija on the other side. This will be your favorite gift. This will become a despised shackle. Your mother will take to church like a dove thrust into the sky. She was faithful before, but now she will go to mass every single day. She will be, you will be forced to go with her until your knees learn the splinters of pews, the mustiness of incense, the way a priest's robe tries to shush silent all the echoing doubts ringing in your heart. The last word on being born to old parents. You will learn to hate it. No one, not even your twin brother, will understand the burden you feel because of your birth. Your mother has sight for nothing but you too and God. Your father seems to be serving a penance, an oath of solitary silence. Their gazes and words are heavy with all the things they want you to be. It is ungrateful to feel like a burden. It is ungrateful to resent my own birth. I know that twin and I are miracles. Aren't we reminded every single day? Rumor has it, mommy was a comparona. Stuck up, they said, head high in the air, hair that flipped so hard that shit was doing somersaults. Mommy was born in La Capital, in a barrio of thirst buckets who wrote odes to her legs, but the only man Mommy wanted was nailed to a cross. Since she was a little girl, Mommy wanted to wear a habit, wanted prayer and the closest thing to an automatic heaven admission she could get. Rumor has it, Mommy was forced to marry Poppy, nominated by her family, so she could travel to the States. It was supposed to be a business deal, but 30 years later, here they still are. And I don't think Mommy's ever forgiven Poppy for making her cheat on Jesus or all the other things he did. Thursday, September 4th, first confirmation class. And I already want to pop the other kids right in the face. They stare at me like they don't got the good sense or manners I'm sure their moms gave them. I clip my tongue between my teeth and don't say nothing. Don't curse them out, but my back is stiff and I'm unable to shake them off. And sure, Caridad and I are older, but we know most of the kids from around the way or from last year's youth Bible study. So I don't know why they seem so surprised to see us here. Maybe they thought we'd already been confirmed with the way our mothers are always up in the church. Maybe because I can't keep the billboard frown off my face, the one that announces I'd rather be anywhere but here. Father Sean leads the confirmation class. He's been the head priest at La Consagrada Iglesia as long as I have been alive, which means he's been around forever. Last year during youth Bible study, he, was, he wasn't so strict. He talked to us in a soft West Indian accent, coaxing us toward the light. Or maybe I just didn't notice his strictness because the older kids were always telling jokes or asking the important questions we really wanted to know the answers to. Why should we wait for marriage? What if we want to smoke weed? Is masturbation a sin? But confirmation class is different. Father Sean tells us we're going to deepen our relationship with God. Of your own volition, you will accept him into your lives. You will be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is a serious matter. That whole first class, I touch my tongue to the word volition, like it's a fruit I've never tasted that's already gone sour in my mouth. Haiku. Father Sean lectures. I wait for a good moment, whispering to see. Boys. X. You make out with any boys while you were in DR? C. Girl, stop. Always talking about some boys. X. Well, if you didn't kiss nobody, why are you all red in the face? C. See, Omara, you don't, you know I didn't kiss no boy, just like I know you didn't. X. Don't look at me like that. I'm not proud of the fact that I still ain't kissed nobody. It's a damn shame. We're almost 16. C. Don't say damn, see, Omara. And don't roll your eyes at me either. 
you won't even be 16 until January. X, I'm just saying, I'm ready to stop being a nun. Kiss a boy, shoot, I'm ready to creep with him behind a stairwell and let him feel me up. C, oh God, girl, I really just can't with you. Here, here's the book of Ruth. Learn yourself some virtue. X, tisk tisk, you gonna talk about this in, in a church then take his name in vain? Ouch. C, keep talking mess. I'm going to do more than pinch you. I don't know why I missed you. X, maybe because I make you laugh more than your stuffy ass church mission friends? C, I can't with you. Now stop worrying about kissing and boys. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Caridad, Caridad and I shouldn't be friends. We are not two sides of the same coin. We are not even ever mistaken for sisters. We don't look alike, don't sound alike. We don't make no damn sense as friends. I curse up a storm and I'm always ready to knuckle up. Caridad recites Bible verses and promotes peace. I'm ready to finally feel what it's like to like a boy. Caridad wants to wait for marriage. I'm afraid of my mother, so I listen to what she says. Caridad genuinely respects her parents. I should hate Caridad. She's all my parents want in a daughter. She's everything I could never be. But Caridad Twin and I have known each other since diapers. We celebrate birthdays together, attended Bible camp sleepovers with each other, spend Christmas Eve at each other's houses. She knows me in ways I don't have to explain, can see one of my tantrums coming a mile off, knows when I need her to joke or when I need to fume or when I need to be told about myself. Mostly, Caridad isn't all extra goody-goody in her judgment. She knows all about the questions I have about church and boys and mommy. She don't ever tell me I'm wrong. She just gives me one of her looks full of so much charity and tells me that she knows I'll figure it all out. Questions I have. Without mommy's Rikers Island prison-like rules, I don't know who I would be when it comes to boys. It's so complicated. For a while now, I've been having all these feelings, noticing boys more than I used to, and I get all this attention from guys, but it's like a sancocho of emotions, this stew of mixed up ingredients, partly flattered they think I'm attractive, partly scared they're only interested in my ass and boobs, and a good measure of mommy will kill me fear sprinkled on top. What if I like a boy too much and become addicted to sex like Ileana from Amsterdam Avenue, three kids, no daddy around, and baby bibs instead of a diploma hanging on her wall? What if I like a boy too much and he breaks my heart and I wind up angry and bitter like mommy, walking around always exclaiming how men ain't shit, even when my father and brother are in the same room? What if I like a boy too much and none of those things happen? They're the only scales I have. How does a girl like me figure out the weight of what it means to love a boy? Wednesday, September 5th, night before first day of school. As I lie in bed thinking of this new school year, I feel myself stretching my skin apart. Even with my Amazon frame, I feel too small for all that's inside me. I want to break myself open like an egg smacked hard against an edge. Teachers always say that each school year is a new start, but even before this day, I think I've been beginning. Thursday, September 6th, high school. My high school is one of those old school structures from the Great Depression days or something. Kids come from all five boroughs and most of us bus or train. Although since it's my zone school, I can walk to it on a nice day. Chisholm High School sits wide and squat, taking up half a block, red brick and fenced in courtyard with ball hoops and benches. It's not like twins fancy genius school, glass and futuristic. This is the typical hood school, and not too long ago, it was considered one of the worst in the city. Gang fights in the morning and drug deals in the classroom. It's not like that anymore. But one thing I know for sure is that reputations last longer than the time it takes to make them. So I walk through metal detectors and turn my pockets out and greet security guards by name and am one of hundreds who every day are sifted like flour through the doors and I keep my head down, and I cause no waves. I guess what I'm trying to say is, this place is a place, neither safe nor unsafe, just a means 
just a way to get closer to escape. Ms. Galliano is not what I expected. Everyone talks about her like she's super strict and always assigning the toughest homework. So I expected someone older, a buttoned up floppy haired suit wearing teacher with glasses sliding down her nose. Ms. Galliano is young, has on bright colors and wears her hair naturally curly. She's also little, like for real petite, but carries herself big, know what I mean? Like she's used to shouldering her way through any assumptions made about her. Today I have her first period English, and after an hour and 15 minutes of icebreakers, where we learn each other one another's names, Ms. Galliano pronounces mine right on the first try. She gives us our first assignment. Write about the most impactful day of your life. And although it's the first week of school, and teachers always fake the funk the first week, I have a feeling Ms. Galliano actually wants to know my answer. Rough draft of assignment one, write about the most impactful day of your life. The day my period came in fifth grade was just that, the ending of a childhood sentence. The next phrase started in all caps. No one had explained what to do. I'd heard older girls talk about that time of the month, but never what someone was supposed to use. Mommy was still at work when I got home from school and went to pee only to see my pansies smudged in blood. I pushed twin off the computer and Googled blood down there. Then I snuck money from where mommy hides it beneath the pans, bought tampons that I shoved into my body the way I'd seen Father Sean cork the sacramental wine. It was almost summer. I was wearing shorts. I put the tampon in wrong. It only stuck up halfway and the blood smeared between my thighs. When mommy came home, I was crying. I pointed at the instructions. Mommy put her hand out but didn't take them. Instead, she backhanded me so quick she cut open my lip. Good girls don't wear tampons. Are you still a virgin? Are you having relations? I didn't know how to answer her. I could only cry. She shook her head and told me to skip church that day, threw away the box of tampons saying they were for cueros. But she would buy me pads, said 11 was too young, that she would pray on my behalf. I didn't understand what she was saying but I stopped crying. I licked at my split lip. I prayed for the bleeding to stop. Final draft of assignment one, what I actually turn in. Xiomara Batista, Friday, September 7th, Ms. Galliano, the most impactful day of my life, final draft. When I turned 12, my twin brother saved up enough money to get me something fancy, a notebook for our birthday. I got him some steel knuckles so he could defend himself, but he used them to conduct electricity for a science project instead. My brother's a genius. The notebook wasn't the regular marble kind most kids use. He bought it from the bookstore. The cover is made of leather with a woman reaching to the sky etched on the outside and a bunch of motivational quotes scattered like flower petals throughout the pages. My brother says I don't talk enough, so he hoped this notebook would give me a place to put my thoughts. Every now and then, I dress my thoughts in the clothing of a poem, try to figure out if my world changes once I set down these words. This was the first time someone gave me a place to collect my thoughts. In some ways, it didn't, it seemed like he was saying that my thoughts were important. From the day, that day forward, I've written every single day, Sometimes it seems like writing is the only way I keep from hurting. The routine is the same every school year. I go straight home after school. And since mommy says I'm la niña de la casa, it's my job to help her out around the house. So after school, I eat an apple, my favorite snack, wash dishes and sweep, dust around mommy's altar to la Virgin Maria and avoid Poppy's TV if he's home because he hates when I clean in front of it while he's trying to watch Las Noticias or a Red Sox game. It's one of the few things Twin and I argue about, how he never has to do half the cleaning shit I do, but is still better, it, but is still better liked by mommy. He helps me when he's home, folds the laundry or scrubs the tub, but he won't get in trouble if he doesn't. <clears throat> I hear one of mom, mommy's famous sayings in my ear, Mira muchacha, life ain't fair. That's why we have to earn our entrance into heaven. 
altar boy. Twin is easier for mommy to understand. He likes church as much of a science geek as he is. He doesn't question the Bible the way I do. He's been an altar boy since he was eight, could quote the New Testament in Spanish and English since he was 10, leads discussions at Bible study even better than the priest, no disrespect to Father Sean. He even volunteered at the Bible camp this summer, and now that school started, he'll miss the Stations of the Cross dioramas his campers made from popsicle sticks, the stick figure drawings of Mary in the manger, the mosaic made of marbles that he hung in the windows of our room, the one that I threw out this afternoon while I was cleaning, watched it fall between the fire escape grates. For a second, it caught the sun in a hundred colors until it smashed against the street. I'll apologize to Twin later, say it was an accident. He'll forgive me. He'll pretend to believe me. Twin's name. For as long as I can remember, I've only ever called my brother Twin. He actually is named after a saint, but I've never liked to say his name. It's a nice name or whatever, even starts with an X like mine, but it doesn't just doesn't feel like the brother I know. His real name is for mommy, teacher is Father Sean, but twin, only I can call him that. A reminder of the pair will always be. More about twin. Although twin is older by almost an hour, of course the birth got complicated when it was my turn, he doesn't act older. He is years softer than I will ever be. When we were little, I would come home with bleeding knuckles and mommy would gasp and shake me, muchacha, siempre peleando. Why can't you be a lady or act like your, or like your brother? He never fights. This is not God's way. And twins' eyes would meet mine across the room. I never told her he didn't fight because my hands became fists for him. My hands learned how to bleed when other kids tried to make him into a wound. My brother was birthed a soft whistle, quiet, barely sit, stirring the air, a gentle sound. But I was born all the hurricane he needed to lift and drop those that hurt him to the ground. Tuesday, September 11th. It's only the first week of 10th grade. And high school is already a damn mess. In ninth grade, you are in between no longer in junior high, but still treated like a kid. In ninth grade, you are always frozen between trying not to smile or cry until you learn that no one cares about what your face does, only what your hands will do. I thought 10th grade would be different, but I still feel like a lone shrimp in a stream where too many are searching for someone with a soft shell to peel apart and crush. Today, I already had to curse a guy out for pulling on my bra strap then shoved a senior into a locker for trying to whisper into my ear. Big body joint, they say. We know what girls like you want. And I'm disgusted at myself for the slightest excitement that shivers up my back. At the same time that I wish for my bo wish my body would fold into the tiniest corner for me to hide. How I feel about attention. If Medusa was Dominican and had a daughter, I think I'd be her. I look and feel like a myth, a story distorted, waiting for others to stop and stare. Tight curls that spring like fireworks out of my scalp, a full mouth pressed hard like a razor's edge. Lashes that are too long so they make me almost pretty. If Medusa was Dominican and had a daughter, she might wonder at this curse, at how her blood is always becoming some fake hero's mission something to be slayed, conquered. If I were her kid, Medusa would tell me her secrets, how it is that her looks stop men in their tracks, why they still keep on coming, how she outmaneuvers them when they do.